talk to you. Good morning and thank you to all my relations who are here today. It's just a wonderful turnout. We want to welcome you to protecting our planet, protecting our children. And this really is focusing on an indigenous vision for intergenerational health and understanding that the need to protect the health of our planet is vital to all of us, but also vital to future generations. And we have a lot of wonderful programming going on at Johns Hopkins Center for Indigenous Health focus on maternal and child health, and then an emerging arena focused also on Indigenous planetary health. My name is Dr. Donald Warren. I'm the co-director of the Center for Indigenous Health, and uh, welcome all of you, and we're so pleased to see such a wonderful turnout. But to get the day started in the right way, I'm just very uh, pleased and honored to introduce my friend Lance Fisher from the Northern Cheyenne tribe uh, in Montana, and I'd uh, love for Lance to introduce himself further and provide us an opening traditional blessing. So please join me in welcoming Lila, Lila, Thank you so much, Matt, for starting us in the right way. Um, so we're just so pleased to have all of you here. Uh, I think we wound up with over 440 people registered. So uh, most online, but quite a few in person as well. I'm really excited about the interest in these important topics that we'll be discussing today. So we'll also uh, start with a land acknowledgement. I think it's important to acknowledge that this is uh, traditional homelands of uh, tribal nations and everywhere in the United States is traditional homelands of uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, so again, I'm Donald Warren, I'm Oglala Lakota, originally from Kyle, South Dakota, on Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And I always like to ask, how many people are in the Kyle, South Dakota? Quite a few, actually that's good, about 10. That's 10 more than usual when you got on this. Um, but if we can pull up the land acknowledgement, I'm really uh, pleased with um, uh, particularly the School of Nursing at Johns Hopkins. They have their land acknowledgement actually out in a beautiful courtyard and uh, acknowledging the original inhabitants of this place. So the Johns Hopkins Center for Indigenous Health respectfully acknowledges and gives thanks to the Piscataway Indian Nation, including the Piscataway Kanoe Tribe of Maryland, Tico Band of Indians, Cedarville Band of Piscataway, and Susquehannock Indians, the indigenous people who are the traditional stewards of the lands of the Chesapeake Bay region. We also acknowledge all indigenous peoples, the traditional stewards of the lands and waters of the United States of America. And I think it's important to acknowledge the deep rooted connection that we have as indigenous peoples with place, with land, and the important role for land-based healing and recognizing that the, the health of the earth is intricately woven to the health of its people. And we're starting to learn that, I think, in modern science. And we'll hear a lot more about planetary health and the role for ensuring that the health of the planet is part of that equation that we move forward with when we think about public health and the health of our people. But clearly, the health of the planet has a, a huge uh, uh, component of uh, addressing that. So uh, on behalf of Johns Hopkins University, I do serve as the Provost Fellow for Indigenous Health Policy, and we're very pleased to have this new building, the 555 Pennsylvania Avenue building. This was the museum, if you uh, remember that, the old news museum, and I think they've done just a remarkable job of uh, refurbishing it and uh, turning it into just a beautiful academic place and a place for convenings for uh, meetings such as this. So uh, we also do have uh, uh, Judd Walson, who is the chair of our Department of International Health. And I think he's uh, connected in through Zoom. So I wanted to um, have uh, Judd Walson have an opportunity to provide a welcome on behalf of the uh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, but also particularly the Department of International Health. So please join me in welcoming Judd Walson. Thank you so much, Don. Thank you all for your kind invitation. Good morning. And in, on behalf of the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this really important event. As you heard, my name is Judd Walson. I'm a professor and, a, and the chair of the Department of International Health at Hopkins. And I'm really sorry that I wasn't able to be there with you in person due to travel. But on behalf of our department, the school and the university, I really want to welcome you all. Last month, I had the opportunity to travel to Arizona to experience some of the incredible work that the Center for Indigenous Health is doing. And that center is housed within our department at Johns Hopkins. Of course, before I went, I had heard a lot about the work of the center, but that experience of being there and seeing the impact of the work with communities and individuals was an incredibly rewarding experience. 
It is my honor, really, to call the amazing individuals who work within the Center for Indigenous Health my colleagues. In thinking about the critical importance of this event and the goals of communicating and sharing knowledge around this topic of an ind Indigenous vision for intergenerational health, I was reflecting on my own experiences in understanding the world through new paradigms. How often do we truly open our eyes to new ways of being in the world? When I was younger, I had the opportunity to spend several years living in Nepal, where I was fortunate to learn the language, and I was living in an incredible community in the Himalayas. And during that time, in learning the language, at some point, I began to no longer translate the world around me from English to Nepalese, but I started to see the world in a completely different light. And it was really a revelation for me to realize that through language, I not only heard and saw the world differently, but I experienced the world in a different way. And bridging experiences in this way, I think, is the path to a shared understanding and ultimately a common vision. Now, this is a small example, one that will be very familiar to many here who speak other languages and have experienced the richness of different identities and cultures. However, this experience felt rel relevant to the topic today. I hope that the incredible speakers that you've assembled today are able not only to tell us and to show us what an indigenous vision for intergenerational health can offer, but through this sharing that we can all begin to truly experience that vision and develop a better appreciation of how such a vision can benefit our planet and our people. Thank you again for the kind invitation to speak today, and I look forward to this very important event. Thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Walsh, and it's wonderful to have him on board with uh, John Hopkins and also as our new department chair, and he really is committed to this work. So it's wonderful to have that level of support from the university and from the Bloomberg School of Public Health. So on our agenda today, as you'll see, the morning is focused on Indigenous Planetary Health, and the afternoon is focused on a lot of our work that we've been doing in maternal and child health. And this is important to bring these worlds together because we recognize the need for the health of future generations is going to be dependent on having healthy families, healthy children, and a healthy planet. So that's why we're, we're bringing these topics together that historically aren't always brought together in one setting, but we, we feel that from an indigenous perspective and through that lens, uh, these worlds really are connected in a meaningful way. So our first uh, talk will be focusing on an overview of planetary health. And the planetary health movement has been just tremendous. And it's wonderful to see what's happening at a, a really a global level with focus on understanding the, the need for the health of the planet, the health of Mother Earth, and uh, subsequently the health of uh, its inhabitants, including the people, the animals, and plants. So we'll talk about an overview of planetary health, and then later we'll take a deeper dive into some indigenous perspectives on planetary health as well. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers, of uh, good friends and colleagues that have known for uh, many years, and just very excited that we're all able to, to come together. So to start us off, we'll have an overview of planetary health from Dr. Sam Myers. And uh, Dr. Myers is interested in policy interventions to improve human health while stabilizing Earth's natural systems. He's the director of the Johns Hopkins Institute for Planetary Health and the Planetary Health Alliance. And he oversees multi-institutional efforts. There's over 390 organizations in 65 countries that are organized around planetary health. And uh, they just moved to Johns Hopkins November 1st. So less than a month ago, we, we actually now have uh, the Planetary Health Alliance and now the Institute for Planetary Health here at Johns Hopkins University. And really excited to hear an overview of planetary health to really understand the, the state of the science as we understand it now. And I think the ideal person to kick us off then is Dr. Sam Meyer. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Meyer. All right, well, welcome everybody. So nice to be here with you all. Thank you, Don. Thank you to the incredible staff at the Center for Indigenous Health for putting all of this uh, together. It was a huge amount of work. Yes. There are online people might need to use microphones. I think, are the mics not picking up? Okay, all right. I will use the mic. <laughs> um, uh, 
uh, but anyway, really, really wonderful to get to be here. And the Planetary Health Alliance and the brand new Johns Hopkins Institute for Planetary Health could not be happier to be sponsoring our very first event here at Hopkins and in DC with the Center for Indigenous Health. Let's see if I can advance my slides. Whoa. Huh. That's interesting. Jumping around. Can we get to it? Okay. Well, this could be a bit of an adventure. Um, <laughs> so I had the really immense honor earlier this year of being at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues at the release of the first ever consensus report on the Indigenous determinants of health. And what really struck me was the extraordinary sort of convergence of the field of planetary health, which has emerged really only over the last 10 years or so, and the science that is connecting the dots between changes in our planet's biophysical conditions and the health of populations around the world, and indigenous knowledges and traditions that go back you know, centuries or millennia that, from a very different starting point, has arrived at very similar conclusions about the interconnectedness of our own health with the state of our planet's natural systems. And I was struck, for example, with the opening sentence of the report that indigenous peoples tend to approach health as an equilibrium of spirituality, traditional medicine, biodiversity, and the interconnectedness of all that exists. And the report goes on to say, an interdependent relationship exists between indigenous peoples and their local ecosystems. The health of the land and of the peoples are synonymous, nurtured through relationships with the physical and social environments, providing a strong basis for health and overall all well-being. And that's that statement that the health of the land and peoples are synonymous could be equally a statement of planetary health. And so it's a, it's a really a striking convergence of very different communities um, coming together. Okay. And we are in this moment, right? This moment in human history where the health of the land is strikingly not good. Right? We are in the midst of what many of us call the earth crisis. Every year, in order to feed ourselves, we've converted about 40% of the entire terrestrial land surface for croplands and pasture. We're using about half the accessible fresh water on the planet, mostly to irrigate our crops. We fish 90% of monitored fisheries at or well beyond maximum sustainable limits. Cut down over half the world's tropical and temperate forests, dammed. Over 60% of the world's rivers, and that number is actually on the way up to about 92% over the next few decades. Uh, we are suffering from growing uh, problems of air, water, and soil pollution at a global scale. As you all know, we're disrupting the climate system. We're on the eve of, of the COP28 meetings in Dubai. Um, we're losing species at about a thousand times the baseline rate population sizes of birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians has fallen by about two thirds. Number of individual birds, reptiles, amphibians, fishes has fallen by about two thirds since 1970. And about a million species are facing extinction. The core premise of this, oh, we're going to jump over there. Okay, the core premise of the um, field of planetary health is the size of our sort of collective ecological footprint, the impacts that our actions collectively are having on our planet's natural system is now exceeding our planet's capacities to absorb the waste we're producing or provide the resources that we're using sustainably. And as a result, our activities collectively are changing 
all of our planet's natural systems at a global scale. So not only are we disrupting the climate system, but we're driving the sixth mass extinction of life on Earth. We're driving global scale pollution, changing biogeochemical cycles, altering land use and land cover, driving scarcity of resources like fresh water and arable land. We're profoundly transforming our natural life support system. And all of these human caused changes are interacting with each other in complex ways that affect these core foundational qualities for human health, right? The quality of air that we breathe, the quality and quantity of food that we can produce, our exposure to infectious diseases and extreme weather events, even the habitability of many of the places that we live. And we've been seeing that in spades over the last couple of years. And as a result, we're now seeing impacts across every single dimension of health, from infectious diseases to nutrition, to non-communicable diseases, to mental health, to displacement and conflict. And just as we in the public health community have sort of come to understand over the last several decades that there are really important social and cultural and political determinants of health, we are now coming to understand that there are very important ecological determinants, that our health is nested in a set of biophysical conditions that we are now changing at the fastest rates in the history of our species. And we're starting to see the impacts of those changes across each dimension of health. So for example, in nutrition, my own research, we've looked at how rising concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are actually changing plant metabolism and altering the contents of nutrients in staple food crops. So we're seeing changes in things like iron and zinc and protein in crops like rice and wheat that we depend on to get sufficient intake of those nutrients. And as a result, that about 100 to 200 million people around the world are being pushed into new risk of those micronutrient deficiencies simply because of these changes in the plant content of nutrients in the actual crops themselves. We've also done research to show that declines in animal pollinators, mostly bees and other insects, are actually causing about half a million deaths every year because we're not optimizing our production of fruits vegetables and nuts that are really important in our diets and preventing non-communicable diseases like heart disease, strokes, diabetes, and certain cancers. And so those are just a couple of examples of sort of not very intuitive, somewhat surprising ways in which our changes to biophysical conditions are coming back to affect either the quality or quantity of foods that we're producing with very significant population level health impacts. And of course, climate change itself is also having very large impacts on crop yields around the world. And we anticipate those impacts will be greater over time. And there are many other you know, types of uh, change that I've listed here. Uh, but what's really concerning is that after several decades of improving figures on uh, food security around the world and declining uh, hunger, what we've seen over the last decade is this reversal of those trends and well before COVID and well before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we started to see the numbers of hungry people around the world starting to rise. We're back up over 800 million people with food insecurity in this past year. And it's concerning that that's actually part of this trend related in many, you know, to many things, but in part to these very rapidly changing biophysical conditions that underpin the entire food production system. But nutrition isn't the only dimension that's being affected. Infectious disease exposure uh, is also exquisitely sensitive to these changes in biophysical conditions. We've all seen this uh, COVID pandemic that hopefully we're coming out of now, um, which is an example of one of these emerging pathogens that can um, uh, spill over uh, as a result of our interactions with wildlife populations. And we've seen many, many other examples of those kinds of uh, emerging infectious diseases. But even uh, apart from those spillover events, we're seeing changes in the pattern of infectious diseases related to land use change. For example, deforestation causing increased rates of malaria or the building of dams in West Africa, leading to huge surges in the amount of schistosomiasis among those populations. 
We're seeing big cholera outbreaks as a response to these very extreme precipitation episodes in many parts of the world. Native communities are seeing the emergence of pathogens out of melting permafrost in ways that are very concerning, particularly anthrax in the far north. And so there, there are many examples of how these changing biophysical conditions affect infectious disease exposure. The non-communicable diseases are also being really significantly impacted. The big um, report that was printed in The Lancet a few years ago that was a global assessment of pollution and health showed that there are about 9 million excess deaths every year as a result of our pollution of air, water, and soil. Most of those deaths were from non-communicable diseases, particularly heart disease and certain cancers. Um, we're seeing heat exposure uh, and morbidity associated with heat exposure rising. Um, as I mentioned, the loss of pollinators increases our exposure to non-communicable diseases, and there are many other examples. In, in Native communities, uh, one of the major concerns that we have is the loss of traditional diets. And so there are many communities where access to things like salmon or caribou or other elements of traditional diets in other parts of the world are being curtailed as a result of these biophysical shifts. And that's creating uh, increased risk for things like heart disease uh, and cardiovascular disease in general as a result of the loss of those traditional diets. And that's an area where I think we need to do more more research. And the mental health effects are an area that's probably under-researched that we're starting to have more and more appreciation for in an area where I think indigenous communities are particularly hard hit, um, in part because you have many communities where entire ways of life, particularly for low-lying Pacific Island nations, uh, far northern communities, where whole ways of life are being threatened by destabilized environmental conditions. But really across the board, we're seeing these very significant mental health impacts, not only as a result of the kinds of surge and disasters like wildfires and extreme storms that we've seen over the last few years, but also as a result of this phenomenon of eco-anxiety or ecological grief, just simply knowing that the way we are living is transforming the world around us and the burden that we carry holding that knowledge um, is increasingly being seen as a source of significant mental health problems. In fact, in this survey across 10 countries, both wealthy and poor countries around the world, about half of 16 to 25 year olds reported uh, mental health impacts associated with global environmental change. Over 45% reported daily mental health impacts from thinking about climate change. So those are very, very large uh, mental health uh, effects. And then finally, you know, the other domain is um, displacement and conflict. And again, the origin, the sort of uh, reasons for population displacement are extremely complex and multifactorial. Um, but we're seeing uh, destabilized environmental conditions as an important driver of this steadily rising numbers in displaced people. And in fact, every year over the last 10 years, we've seen sort of record-breaking numbers of displaced people, the last numbers uh, when uh, over 100 million uh, displaced people, and over half of those are uh, children. Uh, and increasingly, one of the drivers for population displacement are these extreme uh, events like the one that happened in Pakistan a year ago, which displaced 33 million people. About a third of the country was flooded from these very extreme precipitation events. And so we're seeing that more and more this morning I thought it was southern Ukraine and, and the extreme storms that are happening there. But really, there, there doesn't seem to be a day when there isn't a part of the world that's experiencing these very, very extreme uh, weather conditions and displacement as a result of that. And of course, displacement then becomes a driver for very significant health impacts. And it also raises the question when you know, under-resourced people in um, many parts of the world are forced to move into places where they may not be welcome, is that then a seed for um, conflict? And so uh, increasingly that is also a concern. And it's really important to state that, of course, over all of these issues and all of these impacts, there is this incredibly important overarching issue of um, equity and social justice, that the people who by and large are most vulnerable to the kinds of impacts that I'm talking about look very different sort of categorically from the people who are most responsible for 
um, the environmental change that's causing those impacts. And so I mean, we've looked at that in our nutrition work, for example, the people that are most responsible for emitting the carbon dioxide to take us up to 550 parts per million will look very different from the people who suffer the nutritional impact of uh, nutrient poor foods. And so over and over, we're seeing um, this disproportionate burden being borne by indigenous peoples, by the poorest people in the world, by future generations, and by non-human beings. And so there's a, a real moral dimension to this issue that we need to um, emphasize. If I can. So this is really where we find ourselves, right? That the Earth crisis that we are precipitating is now precipitating a global health crisis across every dimension of human health. But fundamentally, the way we are living collectively is now choking the life out of the planet. And if we think that the sort of diagnosis, um, we can go to the next slide, of um, the problem is that the size of our collective ecological footprint has simply gotten too large for our planet to support, then the treatment has to be structural shifts in how we live across all of our systems, not only our energy systems, but food system, manufacturing, built environment, what we call the great transition, but this rapid structural shift in how we live to reduce our ecological footprint and to protect and regenerate the natural life support systems that we all depend on. Let's go to the next slide. The good news is that when we sort of look out across the landscape of potential solutions, we see this very, very rich sort of set of, of possible interventions and approaches across every one of those dimensions of life. So there are incredibly exciting innovations, as you all know, in sustainable energy, in precision agriculture and agroecology and in, in producing our food with dramatically lower um, ecological footprints. Same thing across things like green chemistry or circular economy. And so there are enormous opportunities to actually do exactly what we need to do if we really embrace those practices. We know that we're going to see a demographic transition already. Most of the world has gone through a demographic transition and the human population is starting to fall in those countries. And by the end of this century, that will be true globally. And so we'll start to see simply as a result of educating girls and providing economic opportunities for women and access to contraception for couples who want it, we'll see this demographic transition with human populations starting to fall again. We know we're going to make this transition, hopefully sooner rather than later, to a post-carbon energy economy. We can achieve many of the efficiencies I mentioned in food and built environment, manufacturing, how we design our cities. And so there's a huge role for sort of innovation and technology in pushing forward this, this great transition. But innovation and technology isn't going to get us there alone, right? So we also need um, enlightened policy, which is why it's wonderful to be here in D.C. and uh, in this very rich policy community. We're going to need movement building and activism to demand that we get the kind of enlightened policy and, and changes in the private sector that we really need. And we need to generate knowledge in new ways. And that's one of the reasons we're really excited about creating this Institute for Planetary Health. How do we come together in university environments across disciplines? How do we bring people together to generate transdisciplinary approaches to these very complex systems problems that we're talking about. And of course, we need to acknowledge that knowledge is more than sort of Western science, that in fact, we need to raise up indigenous knowledges and other ways of knowing as equally important in understanding the moment that we're in and addressing that moment. And acknowledge that there also are sort of emotional and spiritual dimensions to the moment that we're in. Something has fundamentally gone awry in the relationship that we have with nature and to each other, and that that needs to be addressed uh, head on. Next slide. I just want to reflect for a minute on sort of in the context of this conversation, what does it mean to decolonize healthcare? It's something that I've been thinking a little bit about. I'm new to the to the conversation. I'm certainly no expert, but I think that it's fair to say that we have come <coughs> over the last sort of hundred years to define health itself 
in a way that's actually inconsistent with the way many people all over the world view their entire identity. That by defining health as sort of the health of this organism, and imagining that there's a very clear and hard sort of boundary at my skin, that we're defining health in a way that doesn't acknowledge that in fact, between me and the natural systems and the communities that I'm embedded in, the boundaries are actually much more porous than that. And it's one of the, I think, really critical insights coming from the Indigenous Permanents of Health report and a way in which we've really gone astray and that we need to rethink our definition of health in a more holistic way, not only to sort of decolonize healthcare or to right a historical wrong or to you know, evidence you know, the cultural sensitivity, but because it's right, because it's accurate, right? And because if we don't define health more holistically to acknowledge that our health is embedded in our planet's ecological systems and biophysical conditions, then we won't get it right and our lives depend on it. This is an image, by the way, that I stole from um, a Native American artist, uh, Stephen Yazi, who's, uh, whose painting is exhibited across the mall right now at the um, uh, Contemporary uh, Native American uh, Art Exhibit, which I recommend to all of you. So um, that's why I chose this particular uh, image. And of course, as we think about decolonizing healthcare, we also need to think about redefining what it means to be a health practitioner. So on the other side, we've defined health and the practice of health care as sectoral and pretty narrow. But in fact, when you start to understand that our health depends intimately on the state of our planet's natural systems, then you realize that we actually need to expand our self-conception as health practitioners and start to think about the ways in which we can advocate for protecting the natural life support systems that we depend on. We, as a community, whether we're nurses or physicians or public health practitioners or mental health practitioners, we carry an urgent message that we collectively can no longer safeguard human health into the future, while the natural life support systems that we're depending on are crumbling under our own ecological footprint. And so we, we need to rethink what it means to be a health practitioner in that context. Next slide. So I would argue that we in the planetary health community need to stand with those in the indigenous health community in asserting that the acknowledged human rights to a clean, healthy, sustainable environment, the right to health, and the rights of indigenous people are actually very much intertwined and entangled rights. And we need strengthened intergovernmental negotiations to be essential elements of an integrated planetary health governance framework. So there are very real implications to this recognition of that entanglement. That indigenous views of health, this idea that the health of the land and peoples are synonymous, and planetary health should be central in thinking about the post-2030 uh, development framework, post-SDG development framework, and that we need to stabilize and regenerate our biosphere's life support systems as integral to achieving all of our other development goals. And so that this a broader definition of health and this recognition of the environmental determinants of health um, could really help us to rethink um, how we have a more integrated holistic set of development goals that recognize those interconnections. And finally, that with leadership from indigenous peoples around the world, we need to broaden and decolonize the actual definition of health and broaden our conception of our responsibilities as healthcare practitioners in order to ensure a livable future for humanity and the rest of life on Earth. And so we very much look forward to uh, long relationships with the Center for Indigenous Health and their leadership in helping to think through how we can both best be partners and allies in that um, process. And finally, in the last slide, I just recommend uh, and welcome any of you to come and join the Planetary Health Alliance and 
uh, come to the annual meeting, uh, get our newsletter, but we'd love to have you in our community. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Sam. And I, I honestly can't think of a, a better person or, or a better perspective to lead this very important effort. And we are looking forward to long-term collaborations uh, as well from the Center for Indigenous Health. And just appreciate you uh, really providing what a wonderful framework to think about planetary health and most importantly, what are solutions moving forward? All right, well, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing a, a good friend and colleague who will be providing us a perspective from an indigenous lens on planetary health. Dr. Nicole Redvers is a member of the Dene Nukwe uh, First Nation from the Northwest Territories in Canada. She has worked with indigenous patient, uh, patients, scholars, and communities around the globe her entire career. She is an associate professor. She's also the Western Research Chair and the Director of Indigenous Planetary Health at the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry at Western University. And she's been involved uh, with local communities, regional, national, and international communities, and actually was a presenter at the one of the World Health Organization traditional medicine summits in India just a couple months ago. And she's also author of the wonderful book called Science of the Sacred, Bridging Global Indigenous Medicine Systems and Modern Scientific Principles. And just on a personal note, I, before joining Johns Hopkins, I was at University of North Dakota, and I was chair of the Department of Indigenous Health, and we had started uh, the uh, Indigenous Health PhD program at UND. And uh, we were so fortunate to be able to hire her coming from Yellowknife, way up in the uh, Northwest Territories. And it was the first time we hired someone at U University of North Dakota. This is in Grand Forks, North Dakota, the northernmost US medical school. I don't think that's a selling point, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and she's the only person I ever heard say, my family's looking forward to moving to Grand Forks to a warmer climate. <laughs> I never heard that. <laughs> but uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Nicole Redbird. Thanks, Don. I've officially been southernized to the weather. <laughs> so I think I think um, as long as I point it this way, it sounds like it's supposed to work. Okay, perfect. Let's try it. <laughs> Raise it when you want to go forward on with it. All right, so we'll just assume this is not working, then I guess. Just going to try one more thing. Okay, set aside. So I have, uh, I'll explain later. You're going to have some work. <laughs> Hi everyone, really, really happy to uh, to be here. It's my first time in DC actually. And um, I, uh, I posted a, a picture on Facebook this morning that I was loving the view from my hotel room, which was uh, a brick wall. <laughs> <laughs> Always nice to see nature, nature places and different places that I go. Um, I'll get you to switch the slide. So it's, it's really important for me coming from uh, my home area as well as a part of our Indigenous research methodologies, even our clinical methodologies and our community-rooted protocols to be able to position ourselves within the geographies that we've come from. But what I'm often very clear about is that it, although it's important to place ourselves within the lands of our ancestors and the places where we were born and raised, it's also a point of accountability. Because when I come to a space and a place, I don't only come as myself. I never speak for myself. It's always on the teachings and the experiences of elders past, present, that I've been honored to be able to share my relationship and lived experience with. So because of that, I group myself within Denade, which is land of the people, treaty territory in the subarctic regions of Canada, where I was uh, born and raised, and have had an honor of being able to uh, raise my kids for the first part of their lives until we move to a southern climate. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Now, I was actually, as you were up here, Don, I was thinking about your words where you often say, you know, to be able to get to true equity, you need to walk through truth. And I feel like Sam's presentation was a good walk through truth for us, setting the stages for the realities. And it's difficult for us, I think, as Indigenous peoples to sit through presentations like that. It is the reality, and we need to be clear about what that is, but it feels like somebody's talking about our mother in that way, and, and there's a pain that comes. I always get a pit in my stomach. I don't know about others, but I hear that kind of information on the state of our mother 
and the state of her health right now. It's very difficult to listen to, but we need to walk through that truth to really understand the scale of the impacts that we're in to be able to get to a place of planetary equity, of intergenerational equity, of interspecies equity, of familial equity, all of these components that come into that. So for me, the terminology planetary health in, in its origin, coming from the community standpoint, is really a westernized term, but, but I use it anyway, and I'm going to explain why. And I often say, just as Sam had noted before, that we are so interconnected, we don't see ourselves separate. In fact, I come from Dene peoples. De means land. Ne means flow. Dene, we flow from the land. We are the land. There's no separation from that. So that interconnectedness is so innate that we don't really separate that. What, what that means is that the applications for what planetary health is is really rooted within our community values of where we come from, the protocols for living that has existed in our regions for thousands of years. There's no separation from that. However, I often reflect in our ceremonies, at least where I'm from, where we always pray to Mother Earth first. We always pray the animals, the winged ones, the ones in the water first where we pray for ourselves. So that centering of Mother Earth, the acknowledgement and the respect for always comes first. So when I go into communities and I talk about work, it's easier for me to translate something like Mother Earth's health, planetary health, and some of the other terminologies that have come out being used in the world. So because of that, I've adopted the planetary health terminology because for me, it's the easiest way to translate within a Western context some of the important components of how we see ourselves rooted into that Mother Earth Foundation first and foremost. This is one of my, my favorite pictures. This is actually in uh, uh, Tibet Lake. It's a lake just north of uh, Yellowknife, just below the Arctic Circle. The trees are a little spindly by that point, but they're still there. <laughs> And this was a picture after about three or four days of spending time out on my uh, family's camp. And my two daughters, uh, as you know, if you had kids, they like to fight lots. <laughs> but it's those moments where we spent time on the land coming home. We were just walking back across the frozen lake to, to go back uh, to our vehicle to get home. Just naturally, they, they start holding hands. And, you know, for me, it's a reflection of the origins of what planetary health meant for me before I started this journey within more westernized spaces, within academic spaces. Because land is a healing place, not in what it gives us for food, for water, but what it gives us in relationship. And those components just naturally come out of our children when we allow them opportunities and experiences to be in land places and bases that reconnect them to ancestral teachings, cultures, and giving them a sense of purpose in who they are. So in the spirit of, of thinking back to that, that origin of, of land as a healing place, as my origin and exploration within the realm of planetary health, I was thinking back at the, the very first presentation that I ever did, which was not too long ago, it was 2016. I was working as a clinician for about 11 years up in my home region before starting to move into this space. So in, in 2016, I was asked to do a Pecha Kucha presentation, which I had to Google at that time because I didn't know what it was. <laughs> And it was basically putting together slides and you had six minutes to present, which was challenging for us as indigenous peoples, trying to figure out how to be able to cover the entire base of land healing within six minutes. But I like a good challenge. <laughs> so I tried to think of how I was going to do that. And it was just at my local museum. It wasn't a big crowd, but it was my first presentation. So I started putting slides together and I, I put pictures together in images. And I created this narrative, and it's very short, six minutes, but I felt the reflection of the years and, and almost the circle kind of coming around in this space of advocating for the importance of Indigenous voices to go back to that origin. And what was the first time that I was thinking about planetary health from an Indigenous perspective, from an Indigenous way? So this is where you get fun work because the slides are clicked. So I'm going to put my finger up <laughs> when you got to switch slides. All right. You can do the first one. So this is what I did. When mother trees are dying, they send messages of wisdom on to the next generation of seedlings. She sends these messages through a vast internet-like fungal network in the soil to her neighboring seedlings to increase the resistance of these seedlings to future stresses. 
which in essence means that trees talk. Like trees, humans have evolved into a network of interdependence that spans the rocks, the plants, the animals, and the air that we breathe. Many have forgotten or are unaware of how or that the ability exists to communicate on the subtlest level to the living and non-living entities that have surrounded us for thousands of years. If we take the knowledge of basic physics to point, we can clearly see that there is no real difference between a person, the food they eat, and their environment particularly if going down to the individual, indivisible fundamental particle level of which is essentially nothing. Great sages and healers were said to come out of deep meditative states, prayer states with the realization that all we are is the thought. Conscious or awareness is not only in the clouds or in some designated point in space, it's right behind the darkness we perceive with closed eyes. Many indigenous cultures cannot separate their bodies and health from the environment around them. Every ceremony, dance, prayer, and song is done to connect with this underlying fundamental energy force with, within the universe that can be heard, felt, and seen when, this, when in the state of mind that transcends the physicality of the body. This adaptation and awareness of the smallest particle level of existence is profound as by definition, if a fundamental particle cannot be broken down any further, it means there's nothing physical about it in the first place. We're spiritual beings. Our lives may only appear to exist, engendered as holographic images on a two-dimensional field that tricks our sense of physicality into a realm that brings more mystery than answers. Ask any trailblazing research physicists. You cannot understand true medicine power in whatever capacity that may be, unless you have an understanding of the nature of things. To understand the nature of things, you need to be in nature, and you need to connect to the animals, the rocks, the plants, the stars, the winds. Land as medicine is not necessarily a physical description of our ability to use plants or animals by taking them into our hands but to understand them like our ancestors did as part of a complex phenomena that we have the ability to affect or be affected by. For example, to burn a plant is said to release its soul. Each plant has a unique soul or imprint on our bodies, whether we breathe it, ingest it, apply it, sending our body very specific messages. To talk with animals, or observe them like our ancestors did and our elders still do today, allows an understanding of the skills and gifts that they have to teach us about ourselves and the world. To heat certain rocks increases its internal magnetism, which interacts with special receptors in our bodies that allows grounding and a reorganization of mineral-rich tissue, such as then in many ceremonial practices. By connecting back to these natural elements, our reality becomes one of peace, understanding, and purpose. We come to know an ancestral haven, regardless of the endless ups and downs in life. Even these cancer cells come from cells that deregulate themselves, recapitulate successfully earlier ancestral lifestyles, so if a cancer is trying to go back to some primordial state, primordial ancestral state, maybe it's trying to teach us something. If the body has purpose in health, wouldn't it also have the purpose in disease? Herophilus stated, when health is absent, wisdom cannot reveal itself, art cannot manifest, strength cannot fight, wealth becomes useless, and intelligence cannot be applied. Chief Dan George, who's uh, chief of the Sitsuwa'atu First Nation, he said, allow me to learn the ways of your book knowledge so that I may combine it with my natural knowledge and lead the way. A bridging of traditional knowledges with modern knowledges may be the only way forward sustainably for people. 
When people have a true understanding of self and the universe, they become one and the same, and through this, they achieve peace. This peace can translate to focus, to meaning, to purpose, and the ability to use this short physical life as a hologram to allow others to achieve the same. Without access to the land and waters for the purpose of reestablishing our inner connections, we will constantly feel like we have something unfulfilled. Pretending to be a rabbit when you're not only leads you down the wrong trail. By deciding to work towards an understanding of the vibrational force, the creative force, which is the universe, we all make a decision to live more than we have ever done before. This is not esoteric. It's indigenous science at its purest and rawest form. Or as my wise sister said, we're not new age, we're native. <laughs> Remember that land is a medicine place, provides a space where we can play our drums to remind us of the vibrational creative force that creates all of these beings. And that the whole world really is inside of us as it is outside. So this was my attempt seven years ago to start bridging different dialogues between planetary health and indigenous health. That's where it started for me. And it's been a journey since then. It's been a journey since then. Now, the collective journey that I've, that I've been on has really reaffirmed for me the reflection that we cannot solve complex problems from the same worldview that created them in the first place, as it will continue to perpetuate the disconnect between us and the planet and its relatives. We cannot solve complex problems from the same worldview that created them in the first place, as it will continue to perpetuate a disconnect between us and the planet as relatives. We cannot solve complex problems from the same worldview that created them in the first place because it will continue to perpetuate the disconnect between us and the planet as relatives. So how do we go from this hierarchical, this human perception of being on the top of the pyramid, this ego, this I approach, human-centric, anthropocentric approach to this eco we cosmocentric, ecocentric, where humans are just one very small part of a larger system. How do we remember that we are within and part of an intricate, interconnected web of simple complexity? How do we re-envision, re-imagine, even our institutions of learning? And I, is Carlos here? There's Carlos. Carlos is the mind brain behind this image. I have to give him credit for that. How do we go from one way of knowing to ecologies of knowing, hierarchical practices to communities of practice, disconnection to reconnection, fear to wonder and awe, universities to universities, anthropocentric to human-centric to ecocentric, despair to hope, domination to participation, hegemony to inclusivity, me to we, knowledge transmission to relational care. I often describe to folks, the best way that I can think about in our conceptions of indigenous planetary health, like a spider web. And I've used the spider web example quite a bit. And if you've seen a spider web and if you've ever walked into one, it's not the most pleasant feeling, but it, if it goes with you, you know, if you pull one side of it, it kind of all comes towards you. And the, the title for this talk, the framing is the path we walk. And in my community, we have a, a term that embodies the path we walk, and it's called Denachanya. Denachanya essentially translates to the path we walk. But we could probably spend about two weeks, just like each one of those slides that I, I used in the Pechacucha, we could probably spend a day about what actually each of those slides mean independently, because that was a very superficial overview of some of these things. So I'm going to give you the, the most superficial overview of, of Denachanya at least from my community's perspective, because even though it's the path we walk, Dene Chania is actually an ecological worldview, an ecological philosophy, an ecological process that is inherent with its own traditional protocols for how to live in the world in a deep way. And this frames our entire narrative, where I come from, how my elders have taught me. And I really want to call out Elder Francois Collette, who does a lot of teaching on this. He's a Denisovan elder from, from back in my, my region. 
And one of the things that that uh, Elder Francois always talks about is, is the reality, of course, that we are just one of billions of life forms on this planet. But each of those life forms is embodied with a creative energy or a spirit. And the spirit is created from the action trails that we leave behind. A spirit is created by the action trails that we leave behind. So what does that mean? Because that's a fundamental statement. Our spirits are created by the action trails we, we leave behind. And what that means is that from our teachings, who we are is based on the actions that we do. The process that we live becomes our spirit. The actions that we carry out in our lives becomes who we are which is an incredibly important way to think about who we are because we're not we're not just there and then we act. We are because we act. See the switch? Spirits are formed by the action trails that they leave behind, but they're also created by the beliefs put forward, the intentions put forward into the world. So what does that mean? A lot of our prayers, if you look at the, the translation or the terminology for a lot of words for prayer, which, you know, prayer is kind of a word that came from a lot of the religious dominations, but the prayer in essence is a cry for the future. It's a cry out for what's to come, an intention, a placement. Even in some of the Eastern traditions, you know, they, they do meditation in this way, this intention, this positive outlook for it. But what our teachings are saying is not only are we made by our actions, but our positive intentions, our views forward, our beliefs about the future help to create that spirit as well, too. So there's the looking back from our actions, but also the forward thinking with our intentions and our beliefs. That is encapsulated in the understanding of the Nechanya. Now, as those spirits are created by our action trails and our beliefs and our intentions forward, we have the, the privilege of being able to interact with many other living beings on this planet. Some we may see, some we may walk by and not even acknowledge in the modern world. But each of those interactions, according to our teaching, creates a knot in the spirit world or an interconnection between those beings that have connected in a certain way. And those knots create the spider web all interconnected, but in their own ways. So that if you pull a spider web, everything shifts with it. So that's the ultimate, you know, richness of something like one word in our languages is that, again, that's a very superficial overview of who we are and how we're interconnected, at least from my community space of teaching and learning. So what I often say, and, and perhaps Sam and others have heard that I, you know, I say planetary health is like a spider web, but that's the first time I've actually explained it in, in a place like this. I, I talk about it in indigenous conferences sometimes, I did last month, but it's very rare for me to do it in this way in other spaces, but I got permission to be able to talk about this. And part of the, the path we walk is the understanding of the holistic and dynamic balance. It's not a balance, a dynamic balance between our emotional, physical, spiritual, and, and um, um, physical, mental, emotional, spirit, spiritual senses. All of these components that, that come together in, in harmony to ensure that we take care of ourselves as human beings. And this is where the health place comes in. We don't take care of that physical body component. It makes it really hard for us to create action trails and positive intentions for the future. So our own responsibility as humans to ourselves, to our families, to our community, actually is part of that spider web. We're one knot, but we have the ability to have an effect on the entire whole. Our life is a balancing act, but sometimes it's actually the suffering. Sometimes it's actually the suffering itself that, that helps us come to terms with the Denichanya, with the path we walk. And I believe right now as a human species, we are in that suffering space right now. Mother Earth is in a suffering space. We've, we've heard that today. But that suffering allows the reflection of the path we walk as 
part of our teachings through the Danachanya. It was an expected outcome based on the things that we've done. And I'm very cautious with, with how I use the term we in these cases, because as we know, many of our community members are some of the least contributors to the problems that we've had. In fact, they've been forcibly marginalized from enabling a lot of the deep solutions that we have for planetary health. So when I say we, I mean we as Indigenous peoples. When I say something else other than we, usually I'll frame it as colonial or you're Western or those types of things. So I just want to be clear about that because I think we have to be cautious too in how we use that term, particularly in spaces where there are many community members that, that try to ensure that those balances come from life. So the path we walk as humans is fluid, it's malleable, it's not predefined. There's often philosophical debates that happen within Western traditions, if anybody's taken a philosophy course in, in Euro-Western ways of knowing. But for us, it's a fluid dynamic balance. And we sit and live with the complexity of the, and the uncertainty. And I see this so well when it comes to our Indigenous students and having the experience in, in the program uh, that Don and I worked, and Allison, I think, is, is well here too with our Indigenous Health PhD students for a number of years. And then for myself, coming now to a, a university where there's, there's not as much Indigenous students, in fact, they're the minority. And one thing that was so striking to me, going from a, a teaching environment with majority Indigenous students to an environment with majority non-Indigenous students at the graduate level, and I, I hadn't really appreciated this so much in, until I saw those two differences, what was the realization of how well our Indigenous students do with dealing with uncertainty, even in assignments. <laughs> And loving the creativity to be able to be flexible and iterative and, and go with the flow comparatively to the anxiety that that provokes in non-Indigenous student groups. And, and that was surprising for me. It was really a, you know, a step back because I came from community directly to an Indigenous you know, majority environment. And then now for the first time in, are in a non-Indigenous majority environment for the first time in my life, really, outside of maybe university, my own university. But it really made me reflect, you know, how are we raising kids? How are we raising kids in Indigenous communities so that they are able to be adaptable to uncertainty and adjust to the complexities of life? Comparatively, what I've seen in, in some of the non-Indigenous dynamics where this anxiety picture, you know, of, of uncertainty just feeds it. And then it made me reflect about the climate movements that are happening right now. We have a lot of youth climate movements, which is wonderful. There's a lot of movements internationally as well. And then I start to think, well, what happens? What happens when you start to think about solutions to our greatest problems from a place of fear, comparatively to a place of love for Mother Earth? How does that difference in your perception of the problem? If you're trying to ensure a continued love, health, interconnectedness, and balance, what kind of solutions comes from that? Comparatively to if you're coming from a fear-based standpoint of destruction and of Earth's end, what kind of solutions does that create? And how do those differ? Do they differ? I think they do. So I am concerned about some of the international movements because I see a lot of fear in there. A lot of fear and a lot of youth that are worried about the future, rightfully so. But sometimes I go to talks, you know, at, at these international events and I see these, you know, very high level youth who have managed to make it into spaces uh, sitting there you know, um, with their phones, like all young people, it seems these days. And then I, I look and I wonder, you know, I wonder how much time that youth has spent on the land. I wonder how often they've been out on the land, touching the trees and the plants and the water, looking at the land in that way. And I wonder what they're fighting for. Do they know what they're fighting for? At these levels so does that change the dynamic of how they approach these issues because we haven't given them a grounding of things like denachanya 
of the understanding, the love and appreciation for the interconnectedness of nature and how that actually follows through to the solutions that we think about to our greatest crises. Now, as I talked about the, the Pechacucha run through as well as Tedichanya, coming from Western scientific backgrounds, oftentimes those kinds of dialogues and conversations can be or seem very metaphorical in nature. And in fact, that's part of the epistemicide or the killing of knowledge that has occurred through colonization is the suppression of different forms of narratives that are trying to communicate realities about life, but we just do it in different ways. Sometimes we don't go into depth because there's no need to. And in fact, describing in detail or explaining things can be uh, disrespectful to the protocols of the sharing of these kinds of narratives that we have. But our indigenous scientific method can be described as contextual. It can be described as holistic, symbolic, nonlinear, not defined by time. And it can be shared in metaphoric or real narratives. So when something appears to be metaphoric in indigenous context, it's likely real. When something is shared from an indigenous concept, context that appears to be real, it's likely also metaphoric. There's extra levels of appreciation and understanding the depth that, that one simple word can sometimes take months to digest and figure out the layers of meaning that are embodied behind it. And one of the best examples that I, I like to use in, in many scientific spaces and places is the idea of our interconnectedness with water. And for many folks, of course, that have taken a high school biology course, you know, human bodies approximately 60% water, give or take. So depending on where you live, because it takes about on average three months for cellular turnover to happen in your body, for your cells to replenish themselves. It's a little bit different depending on the system's digestive tracts a little quicker. But overall, we could say general average about three months for cellular turnover in your body. So if I'm back home in my home region, and I've been there for about three months drinking the water from Tuneve or Tucho, which is otherwise known as Great Slave Lake, 60% of my body is that lake. I stand here as a lake before you, just like you sit before me as the rivers and lakes where you come from. We are literally walking lakes and rivers from the earth. So when I say we are interconnected with water or nature, it may seem metaphorical, but there's a physiological basis to that interconnectivity as well too. It's also very real. But we don't sometimes appreciate that in the context of Western ways of knowing and systems because we haven't put those real and metaphoric narratives together, which is the most important part of being able to delve and experience and why stories end up being so powerful in our communities, but also in the wider world at sharing information because there's a way about them that can bring out both that real and metaphoric perspective that is inherent within our indigenous scientific way. Now, it's important for me to always make space for elders in talking about this subject. And I had the privilege this just this past spring um, in my home region of having a, a beautiful talking circle with uh, some of my Dene elders talking about planetary health, actually, in the, in the context of healthcare and just doing a lot of listening and, and sharing in that space. And I'm looking forward to being able to share that work out with the elders very soon. But some of the words that they shared was that the Western way is not beneficial to us. It's detrimental to our DNA. We need reconnection. We are not just here like that. We are here for a reason and have a purpose here. The plants, rivers, lakes, wind are all our relatives out there. We need the raw, real indigenous knowledge because it is coming from the land. So as we think about planetary health as a field and indigenous peoples moving forward on the walking path on the Denichanya, I share a few more reflections from a separate project that was looking at how we bridge two very different systems. And notice how I didn't say integrate, which I think is really key because oftentimes 
integration can mean assimilation, bridging partnership, working together. We're all trying to have healthy communities. We need to work together. We need to talk, to respect, and to honor one another. We like the idea of where the two rivers speak. Those were shared from some natural elders. So as I reflect on the significance of this meeting and how far the Western planetary health movement has come, Adam may remember this picture. <laughs> this was, and actually Don, I think you were there too. And probably Carlos, I think there was a few people here. But this was the, um, a presentation that we put together kind of last minute at the Planetary Health Alliance Conference back in Stanford in 2019, perhaps? 2019. And I brought a couple elders from my home region, uh, Satu Elder Besset London, who's there, and, and Rossi and Shalik, and we had a, a beautiful young woman as well um, from the Ohlone territories that came up with us as well. And I had some stark things to say at that panel. And what I had seen from my experience, which is not uncommon, this is not exclusive to the planetary health space by any means. It was ex it's exclusive to all fields, as we all know, in, in Western uh, places, is that there's often not a lot of centralization or place or space for indigenous belonging within movements. Um, and for me, you know, at that point, the elders, we were in a lunch and lunch. Uh, conversation instead of on the main stage. But what I really appreciated about the Planetary Health Alliance and Sam and Marie and all the voices that, you know, that have been within this space is that they listened and they took action and they changed and they opened doors and possibilities to ensure further inclusion of Indigenous knowledges and Indigenous people through that. And for me, that takes a lot of courage in these westernized spaces. So because of that, I really want to thank the PHA for having the courage to be able to change the narrative and do things a little bit differently. And then also for John Hawkins as well, too, for being able to open these kinds of spaces to start to bring those conversations, the partnerships and the bridgings together. Because although there's been a long history of effects, there's a lot of trust that's been broken in spaces and places. We are at our point with our Mother Earth system that my elders from my region say we need to work together, but we need to do it in a good way with understandings of the foundations of things like the path we walk. Have a respectful conversation because it's for our children and our grandchildren, which is what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. So I want to I want to just wrap up with a project that for me is the best embodiment of planetary health. And back in 2018, we formalized an urban land-based healing camp in Yellowknife. It's, uh, Yellowknife is not where I grew up, but it's where I worked for 10 years. It's just a little further north from where my home community is. And it was one of the first urban land-based healing camps in North America that we knew at that time. This was back in 2016. And we, we specifically brought elders together across the circumpolar regions, uh, both Inuit, Métis, and, and uh, First Nations elders and we wanted to ensure that the traditional protocols that this camp was followed, combined with our indigenous education and traditional uh, therapeutic interventions, really to be able to embody the, the land connection for folks that are in urban places. Because as we know, a lot of our unhoused relatives and folks have difficult times sometimes accessing these kinds of spaces and places. So this camp was uh, in answer to that. And one of the things that was so profound for me when we built, because we literally built it with our hands, we had to fight with the fire marshal quite a bit first before we were allowed to build it. They made us actually do an architectural drawing of a teepee. Yep, <laughs> they did. <laughs> and tried to get us to have fire resistant teepee hide um, material, but we dealt with that. <laughs> Once we got through all that bureaucracy, we wanted to ensure when people came out, even though it was an urban, an urban place, that it felt like you were going to your grandma's house or out on the land at your grandma's place. That the smells, the touches, the sights, everything was there for the experience. It wasn't only just going to talk to somebody. And why this is important for me as a planetary health component is, is we got together a number of elders, knowledge holders, land defenders, a number of a few years ago now to de define what we term the determinants of planetary health. So what are the things, what are the factors that makes Mother Earth well? What are the factors that needs to be in place for the planet to be well? And one of the overarching determinants was indigenous people's health, 
and Indigenous elders and children. Indigenous peoples currently right now host and steward 80% of the remaining biodiversity on the planet, one third of the remaining old growth forests. So if the Indigenous peoples have their health, have their sovereignty, have their culture, have their self-determination, have their land, they will continue to be able to steward 80% of the remaining biodiversity on the planet, one third of the remaining old growth forests, including stewarding 4,000 of the remaining 7,000 traditional ecological based not, uh, languages that exist and are left on the planet. So indigenous people's health needs to be looked at in a holistic context that it's not only the health of our communities, it's the health for all and it's the health of the planet. So this is why healing programs, land-based healing programs, and activity programs are so integral for planetary health because it's important for Indigenous people's health. So I want to just end today. It's a, a short five-minute video of this camp that we built with our, our elders back in our home region with blood, sweat, tears, and, and fire marshals. <laughs> Go ahead. Donald Prince, uh, Executive Director, CEO of the Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation. We have this camp here to help people in the community, whether that be uh, counseling, traditional medicine, traditional ceremony, those kinds of things. A lot of people come out here just uh, to hang out, to talk, talk with the elders or talk with them, myself or William or Ruth. Uh, sometimes individuals come, sometimes couples sometimes families. My name is Bessa Blondin, and I come from Delina. I am the elder uh, of the camp. I work here to, uh, to help people in counseling, and I also help people in healing. One of the big things that we look at is trying to meet people where they're at, you know? If, uh, for example, the Western-based counseling generally says, well, you come in for one hour a week or something like that. And then if you miss your appointment, well, too bad, you can't come in. There, we, we ask people to come out here every day uh, if they want, you know, drop in anytime. If you want to make an appointment, we can do that too. I always ask advice with elders. How can we help our people? And they say the only way you can do that is bring that cultural values back so that they can be proud of who they are. And, and they're not the modern society people. They are cultural people uh, with incredible, incredible way of life. And that is what we look at implementing uh, when we start to build Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation. Our counseling, I guess, is done while we're doing something, you know? We might be building something, and there's a couple of guys who are doing building things with them. And they stop for a couple minutes and say, you know what? And they start telling me something about what happened with them in their childhood, some some really negative experience they've had, and we'll talk about So we'll take a break, and we'll talk about that for a while, you know, and then carry on, and then check in with them later, you know, how are you feeling about that? What's happened to you is that it's not your fault, but what you have to do is to look at yourself. We're going to put a place out here for you. You can come over here anytime, eat traditional foods. But I always tell them that it's, it's you yourself inside your heart. If you want that change, that's up to you to make that change. But we're here to help you the best we can. But we don't tell you how, how to live your life, but we tell you how you could be living this life even with more healthiness and more wellness and the best you can be. One of the things that the, when you go to counseling is that they ask you, okay, well, what happened to you at residential school? And we don't ask them that here. We don't want to know all the bad things in their life. Uh, let's talk about something good, you know? If we're going to talk about your experiences as a child, what was good about it, you know? What did you learn from your dad or your mom or grandparents or whatever on the land or hunting or whatever, you know? What is good? And help them to look at the, some positive things in their life. And uh, from there, people will open up after a while. You know, they'll talk about different things and sometimes we'll push them a little bit, you know, but only if it seems like it's, they're ready or it's where we have the safety 
of the of the people here or the camp to do that? This camp is to help you reconnect with your families also so that they can have all the tools that you just learned. And you need to pass that on. I said, everything we teach you here, you can't keep that for yourself. You need to pass it on to somebody else that you can help heal. The experience of our life that we've gone through, it's an experience of, of life, but there's answers to healing. There's answers to counseling. There's answers for treatment. There's answers for aftercare, for whatever you want to put in place so you can get better even much more. This is why, as I said, we, we have this camp. We're bringing back your tradition, your way of life, so that you can get even much more connected, not only with us, but connected with the people. And you can help the people on the street. You can help the people that are homeless. You can help people that are struggling because you went through that yourself. That's the greatest education you have. And from here on, you help them with that tool of healthiness now because now the people will see you and, and you will be standing tall and people will come to you. And all you have to do is hug them and tell them how much you love them and how much you care and that you're there to help them. That's all you have to say. And that will bring happiness to them and to make that change. We're on Facebook and we have, uh, we're behind the field house. Sometimes we make things more complicated than they need to be. And whenever I have uh, Indigenous students, they often have sometimes a hard time narrowing down their topic areas and their subjects because there's so much issues and complexity in the world and communities. But what I often tell them is sometimes it's not a matter of finding solutions directly. Sometimes it's just a matter of creating spaces so that the solutions can come forward on their own. Masi Cho, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Redvers, and um, what a beautiful way to start our morning and really understand the complexity and the beauty and the simplicity of the of the framework that we're talking about. And, and I'm struck thinking about some of the terminology that we use, like when we say Mother Earth, we're not being poetic or metaphorical. We, each of us is an outcropping of Earth. All of our carbon, all of our minerals, all of our water comes from the Earth. So when we say Mother Earth, it's because it's true from a scientific perspective. I think it's a wonderful framework as we, we look at the rest of the, the day. So we're scheduled for a 15 minute break now, uh, but we want to start right at uh, 1045. We have a wonderful panel, uh, three speakers that come to us from uh, indigenous communities with different perspectives as physicians, lawyers, uh, tribal leaders, and people who are involved in national and regional movements around indigenous planetary health from various perspectives. So we'll take a brief break here, um, but let's uh, provide uh, one more thank you to uh, Dr. Myers. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get restarted. Uh, thank you so much for reassembling and just very excited about this panel. Uh, we get to hear from three just wonderful indigenous women leaders who are working in this space from different perspectives. Uh, each of them will uh, provide about uh, 12 minutes or so of, of uh, presentation. If we have time at the end, we can entertain a couple questions as well. Our first speaker will be Dr. Allison Kelleher. She is Koyukon Athabaskan. Uh, she is originally from Nome, Alaska, and her people are also from the uh, um, uh, Koyukon Athabaskan, the Nalato community in, in Alaska. She's a family physician and is the only uh, board certified family doctor also formally trained as a traditional healer from the indigenous Alaskan uh, ways of healing and she's on faculty with us now here at Johns Hopkins University uh, in both the School of Nursing and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our second speaker will be Anne-Marie Chispilly and she serves in a dual capacity at Northern Arizona University in Blackstaff, Arizona. Uh, she works in both the uh, works as both the vice president of the Office of Native American Initiatives, and she also has supported the Institute for Tribal and, uh, uh, Tribal Environmental Professionals uh, for the last decade. And she's been working with 
indigenous communities all over uh, the US and, and North America. She has her JD, her law degree from St. Mary's University and her master's of environmental law from Vermont Law School. And our third speaker will be Jill Sherman Warren. She's executive director of the Native American Environmental Protection Coalition, where she works with 28 tribes in the Southwest, including California, Arizona, Nevada, and New Mexico. She's a graduate of Humboldt State University, and she's an enrolled member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe, where she also serves on tribal council. Uh, and full disclosure, she's also my sister in law. <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice. <laughs> So um, again, we'll hear from different perspectives. We have perspectives from a physician, an attorney, and a tribal council person, each with wonderful experience in this space. So please join me in welcoming this wonderful panel. Thank you. Um, as John mentioned, uh, I am originally from Nome, but my people are the Dana. That means that we follow my mother's clan line. We're matrilineal. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, we are uh, from the King Salmon clan. And I introduced myself in Danakanaka and Dana or Koyakan at the Baskin, as the anthropologists call us because language is sacred and language is healing. And we're making efforts, of course, to bring our language back. And we would say that our language is making efforts actually to bring itself back. When I was participating yesterday in a Changing Climate Minds a group dialogue, I heard a concept that I just wanna share with you, that having discussions and interacting directly with climate as a distinct um, entity is so important. And so today I feel like we're having a discussion with the climate in order to um, assuage some of these difficult scenarios that we're faced together, um, that we're facing together. And I wanted to tell you and share with you a little bit about the stories of balance and how we maintain health from our perspective we have an upper, a middle, and a lower kingdom. And my friend Janice takes wonderful photos. So thank you to Janice for your permission, Janice Doherty and Noam for sharing this beautiful image of the upper kingdom, the sky kingdom, the uh, caribou clan who brings with it beauty. And beauty is not just a superficial concept in our world as uh, Dino peoples. It actually means health and balance. The esoteric language, the esoteric meanings in our languages continue to reveal themselves to me. And to be in beauty and to be in health in our language actually means to know who you are and to know where you come from and to know how to be in relationship with the three kingdoms, the upper kingdom, sky kingdom, beauty clan, the middle kingdom, which I'm a descendant of, is the water clan, the King Salmon people, and we stand for resiliency. And we are in balance also with the third kingdom, who is the earth clan or the strength clan and the bear clan. So I bring all of those clans with me today because we need to take care of each other. We need to be in balance with each other. And of course, we feed and nourish each other. I also feel compelled to share with you about one of my favorite and most valued relatives, the ice people. The ice people are essential for protection. We say when the ice is in, the table is set. We cannot eat and our animal relatives cannot survive without the ice who they haul out on. And um, ice plays such an essential role for planetary health. Um, you can see in these images that uh, from the circumpolar north, the perspective of the circumpolar north, um, from the 80s compared to now, we have a dramatic, a drastic, uh, sometimes apparently I call that dramatic, uh, <laughs> decline in um, up to 80% of the old ice. So this old ice holds within it knowledges of how to exist despite adversity, and how to protect us. So I just want to advocate for knowledge is around preserving ice and being aware of the essential role that it plays. 
we've only been measuring sea ice for approximately 10 years. And so we estimate, um, and so some of these estimations are just from uh, satellite photos, but I want to mention also that um, being out of balance contributes to, of course, uh, wildfires, uh, flooding, and um, tremendous other changes. We as Dana people are in balance with our relationship, uh, are in balance with our environment in that when Raven created us, long story short, uh, we were considered to be so poor um, that we were given permission to live off of the animals, to clothe ourselves, um, because we cannot live in our environment without the animals, whereas the animal kingdom can live clearly without us. So we have that special relationship through Raven Creator to have um, food, sustenance, clothing, uh, as you can see here with my great-grandmother and my auntie. Thanks so much, Loretta. <laughs> um, let's see. So despite all of these challenges, um, opportunities like this bring us together to find uh, priorities for funding and then um, also for us to work together, particularly um, coming together with different geographical and um, other specific priorities. So the folks in the Circumpolar North are organizing, and I'll give you a list of some of those organizations coming up. Here's a wonderful photo of my family in Utkiagovic, just to show you um, uh, and honor the power of the polar bear and the power of the whale. We believe, as it is, that these animals give their lives for us and to us, and we have an extremely rich and intact uh, trade relationship so that in our communities, we redistribute foods and prioritize those that are in need so that no one goes without which is particularly challenging when we're facing scarcity. The other challenge I want to mention is that the lack of sea ice contributes tremendously to erosion on the level of 50 plus sometimes feet per year. And of course, this has led to mass relocations, particularly in coastal and rural Alaska, where our Alaska Native peoples are living. I also want to uh, put a special prayer out there to our Bering Sea snow crab. Um, many people are struggling to believe this as a truth. Um, when I tell this story, it's kind of challenging. So I, I feel like I was born into an upside down, inside out world, right? Where the dominant priorities sometimes um, have a, a stronger narrative. But the truth is, that without balance, these kinds of things can happen. Where a two and a half degree temperature increase over the past 40 years has contributed to 10 billion Bering sea crab eating themselves out of life and home. So they, they increase their temperature, their metabolic rate increase, and now we have less than 10% of the crab population surviving just because they starved. Our fisheries are also uh, collapsing, and that's a particular challenge that we're faced with. I mentioned that the King Salmon Clan is the Resiliency Clan, and so I'm inspired that we can make it through this time, but of course we must do it together. At the University of Alaska Fairbanks, my alma mater, we're advocating to come together across the Circumpolar North. Here's another opportunity to join us at the One Health, One Future. I'd also like to thank um, the Alaska Community Action on Toxics, who is an excellent resource for Circumpolar North advocacy and um, mitigating the effects of um, the Arctic warming. So in the Arctic, we have a particular sink where we have increased um, toxicity, increased pollution because of the dynamics of the atmosphere. We also experience increased um, increase effects of heating. So Native Movement, Citizens Climate Lobby, the Alaska Federation of Natives are also really helpful resources for this kind of information. I encourage you to reach out if you're interested. And I'm reminded of a prophecy from my grandmother, Rita Blumenstein. She said that the time of the white raven 
would be a time for our healing and our medicine to come back. So in the last couple of months, the white raven has been seen in Anchorage, Alaska. And I'm honored to know that this is the, uh, the recognition of a tremendous prophecy and a wonderful opportunity for us moving forward. I thank all of my ancestors that have uh, come from the dawn of creation and into eternity. And I thank all of you as well. And I'm reminded of great grandmother spider web and the prophecy that all people from all over the world would eventually be connected by her. And so with that, I thank you, Adam Lucy. Oh, good, good morning. Can you all hear me? Awesome. I'm Anne Marie Chili, and I am uh, the vice president at Northern Arizona University for um, Native American Initiatives. And uh, for the dinner in the room, Adoneki, not Totene, it's Pachini, it's Pachini, 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 Adoma, Deskishin, Deskishin, Lashon's fall, I'll go to Chimito, I use the Nasha, I'll go to the Nest, Sanch, Yate, and also. So, who are my relatives? The Nest. Anybody got some relatives in here? All right, see? You know, I was in Paris one time and I was listening to a, a I'm not full of Steve Jobs here. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, there was, a, there was this huge auditorium and somebody came up to the stage and there was a presenter and he said his plans and he said, I say this even though I'm in Paris because there's always a Navajo in the room. <laughs> so here we are. Um, so today my topic we're going to include, oh, and let me do translation. I am of the Red Sheik and the Water Tobacco people, born for the Bitter Water people. My maternal and paternal grandparents are one who walks around and Wolf's Path clan. I'm from two small communities on the Navajo Nation called Shanto and Chilchindato, where I currently also homestead. And all of those things make me the next woman standing before you this morning. So yate, hello to all of you. So um, today my topics are gonna, I'm gonna have to look back because I really, oh, I can see it over here. Um, um, I come from North, I come from NAU, that's the Native American Cultural Center right there. And in front of it is a teepee, as you can see, we sit at the base of San Francisco Peaks, which is um, sacred to 13 tribes in that region. And about two years ago, I came into my position as vice president of the American Initiative. And the new president, on behalf of President Cruz Rivera, came in as well. And one of the things that um, he came, he's from Puerto Rico. And I remember the very, very first call I had with him. It was during COVID, and I don't need it right now. Yeah, we, we can go back. I think it's on a timer, so if you could keep that for me. Yeah. Uh, I was sitting by myself in a room, and he was interviewing me. And everyone said six months, right? You know those six months aren't really going to mean six months, right? And so he says to me, after our pleasantries and hellos, and he just got down to business and said, so Emory, how are we going to decolonize in AU? And I was just like, did anyone hear that? Did anyone else that heard that? And, uh, and so about that, he said two words, we? and decolonize meant that he knew that NAU, this institution was colonized. And so my job is to take it from colonization, de decolonize it, and I look at it as planting. I'm a really bad gardener, but I know what gardening entails. You take out the weeds, you prepare the soil, you take out carefully, right? You don't just take it all out and sweep. You make sure that the soil is prepared for the next season. So that's decolonization in my mind. Indigenization, which is my job as well, is to then plant seeds, right? Plant seeds where we're going to go next. And this is for generations to come. So that cycle goes round and round and round so that we keep and maintain our health. And so what we're doing at NAU is that process now. My job is to decolonize and indigenize as well. And so you see in this picture here, there's a teepee in front of it. And never have before at NAU, they had allowed TPs because of the Faria Marshall, because it was an infrastructure that wasn't completely done. Those policies were just like, whatever. And so I called the president and I said, 
I went to Ethiopia and he said, guess what he said? It's your land, do what you want. And so for the first time in the last two years, we have put up that teepee with students. Every morning at dawn, those students come and they take it down. They now know the protocols of putting it up, walking around it, smudging themselves. So that's what some of the advancements were made. So two things I want to talk about, leadership matters and about getting out of your lane. And I'm up here as an environmental attorney who turned to a vice president at a health conference. So all of those things, I'm out of my lane and really challenging people to step out of their lane because what we're dealing with in this next coming 20 to 30 years is not going to be pretty. So I need all of us to step out of our lane and really reach into different communities, different circles that need to hear our voices. Next slide. I will speed up. So protecting our planet, I broke this into three things. I'm a, an attorney, so I, I listen to my talking points. So the first one is protecting our planet. Last two weeks ago, the National Climate Assessment 5 came out. Anybody? All right, we have two people that know about this. This is the National Congressional Report about what's happening in the United States right now. And for the last four years, it's been, this is a report about the last four years about the state of the United States and what's happening. And so if you look at this long list, I circled indigenous peoples for a reason. We're the only ethnic race or political group on this page. Why? Anybody guess? I'm gonna be interactive here. <laughs> I work with college students all the time. And if you're not, if, I, if you're on your phone, I'm gonna call you out. <laughs> because indigenous, at least we've had this chapter for three times, so this is the third iteration. So indigenous people are disproportionately impacted by climate change because of our subsistence lifestyle and socioeconomic status. Boy, did I remember that one. That sentence alone should be disheartening because I want to see us one day not be a chapter. I want us to one day be thriving, be at the front. And my um, colleague at the very friend, I was so glad you took over all the, the bad things that's happening in climate change because that's all of this report. We are not doing well as a people, as a society, as human beings right now because in CA 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you would think all the recommendations that we're supposed to be achieving, none of them are achieving, right? And right now, COP28 is starting in Dubai, right? And guess who's not there? Our president. I, I like Joe Biden, President Biden, I should say, like I know him, my friend. I like President <laughs> Biden, Joe. Um, <laughs> And unfortunately, I don't know why he's not there as a leader of the free world and the top. I know why, because there's a lot of other things happening, but there's a lot of politics involved as well. And so as I look at these things, and I watch world events happening. And I keep thinking to myself, when are we going to make that change? You know, when, what's going to be, we're past tipping points. Let's just say that. So next slide. I'm going to tell you about the key messages that have occurred in the Indigenous Peoples chapter. I was not in that chapter. I was stuck in the Southwest chapter underwater because I'm a former water rights attorney, but I gave them peace of my mind in that chapter too. So, but these are the key messages for the Indigenous Peoples chapter. If we could bring up the next one first, I'm read just the bottom part. And don't mind these. These are just like our very nerdy way of saying it's well cited, right? So climate change continues to cause negative effects on critical aspects of indigenous people's well-being, including their livelihoods, health, nutrition, and cultural practices, as well as the ecological resilience of their territories. So that's what's all bad stuff, right? That's like well known. Next up, we say, whoop, indigenous peoples are responding in diverse ways, including energy sovereignty. So the key thing about this message is they saying the bad things but then they're saying the good things. So one of the good ways that we're working through indigenous cultures right now is through our energy systems. And so I just wanted to really put a key point on how it's no longer just all bad. 
We're now saying this is our response and this is what we want to happen. Next up. By exercising our right to self-determination, Indigenous peoples can respond to climate change in ways that meet the needs asp and aspirations of their communities. However, we should just circle my editing here. Their ability to exercise this right is often undermined by institutions and policies shaped by impacts of, guess what? Settler colonialism. Ooh, I'm so glad someone put it in there because I think so many times, oh, part of what I have to do is halfway educate people about what settler colonialism, and then we finally get to the new parts of what we have to do. So these are some of the things that we're working on. So what they recommended is expanded support from federal and state governments has potential to uphold indigenous rights to self-determination for, for guiding climate resilience. So basically telling federal and state government, let us do it our way. This is our way and we know how to do it. Next. Third one, indigenous peoples lead numerous actions and res that respond to climate change, indigenous led organizations, initiatives, and movements that have dominated diverse strategies for climate adaptation and mitigation that are guided by indigenous knowledges. Bingo, the word we wanted to see, and values and by the pursuit of indigenous rights. I think for me, indigenous rights, indigenous knowledges is the key word that we've been looking for for a long time. And I've started this since 20, I've started that work for since 2014. But I just want to say these are the three key recommendations that these that indigenous peoples put forward. Basically, what was happening right now is not helpful, and these are our recommendations. Highly recommend all of us in this room concentrate and read, well, the whole document, but primarily that chapter. Moving on. So about two years ago, no, three years ago, the climate change four were missing steps, were missing incredible information, and me and um, Rachel Novak from BIA, gotta give her credit. We said, um, how are we gonna fill in those gaps? Well, like I said, this document has to, the NCA5 has to be well, well cited. So we started the staff report, the status of tribes and climate change report. It was by 90 authors, 34 narratives. Basically what we said was we filled in those gaps. So now the NCA5 can then cite from it. Right. If you don't have a, if you have a gap, fill it. That's all I can. One of my recommendations, and it was shared by the U.S. Senate hearing, and it was also the international uh, intergenerational uh, IPCC. I can't remember all the words. So this is this was three authors who got together and worked for two years on this report, and we're starting the next one. And so what we're concentrating on. Ooh, I gotta go faster. Okay, next up. And these are the key recommendations. I'll let you read this report as well. Basically, is telling them, again, let us make our own decisions. Let us do what we need. Fund us, and we'll do all right. And that's at the United Nations. That's the report as well. If you protect us as indigenous peoples, you will be protecting 80% of the biological diversity in the world. So you have to protect indigenous people so that they protect their land. So then it protects the planet. That's kind of one of the messages that was going forward. Next. So ITEK, this is the new governmental work for IK, TEK, TK. This is the evolution that I see it from my point of view. It started in 2014 when we put together the guidance for use of traditional knowledges and climate change initiatives. That was 20 of my best friends led by Dr. Burr, Gary Morishima from Quinault and myself. We've said that the United States can no longer say no to tribes when they want funding, when they want to use their indigenous knowledge. Two, EPA stepped in and said, oh, okay, we'll do our own. Next. And then the third one was the commission. This is both Canada, United States, and Mexico. They all have indigenous um, elders on their team. And lastly, you remember this fall, last two falls ago, this um, memo came out, what basically said that all 15 federal agencies, you now have to put indigenous knowledges into your guidance. You have to develop guidance. Talk about policy breaking, right? Talk about indigenizing the United States government. And so next, so my buddies and I spent all summer 
working on the first draft for the guidance and the training for all of the DOI, 40,000 um, DOI members. And so when you now work with federal agencies, you should ask them where they are on their guidance documents because they should be working on this. And they should be not, and they should understand what indigenous colleges are. And more importantly, from a lawyer's attorney's viewpoint, they should know the protections, right? And so for me, indigenous knowledge is equal, equal to intellectual property. Your stories, your guidance, your prayers are all intellectual property and should be protected. There are so many, I, I oversee tribal consultation at NAU, so I saw all researchers stuff, and they are trying to chomp already and take out. So be very protective of your what you're talking about and how you're presenting things, because people will want to take them, right? I know it, I'm seeing it. Moving on. So at NAU, now we're going to move to protecting our children. What I say, protecting our children, number one thing we can do is to empower them. Let them know who they are, where they are coming from. And so what we're doing, and we have two major grants and centers that have come in. Basically, we're infusing all of the students, staff, faculty, and administration about what indigenous knowledge is. This. Why should we care about it? We're getting them out on the land. We're having them do ancestor skills. We have an elders program where they're actually learning how to work. But these students, 30,000 of them, 30,000 of them are now being required to take an, a course on indigenous peoples. That's changing. That is changing the cycle of what we're doing at NAU. Next. And lastly, we are now looking at a new center, a new college um, of medicine that will be opening up in the next three to five years. And it will focus on rural, underserved, indigenous health, and led by an indigenous VP. Dr. Julie Baldwin. Leadership matters because our president has agreed to all of these things. And we have a tuition rate for all Native American students in Arizona. I put it forward, the president says, hmm. And then I say, okay, this is how we're gonna do it. Then he says, okay. So what I'm saying is that things can be changed at an institution. It can be decolonized and indigenous. It takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of as I say, the squeaky wheel. But I'm telling you, it can be done. And I'm asking all of you, as I always challenge my audiences, to step out of your zone. Find something you need to work on, challenge people. And I say leadership matters because we're coming into a new year where guess what? A new leader of this free world is gonna be chosen. If we're not out there working on behalf of this new person or the values that we support, other values will come in. And I'm really concerned about it because we're at the tipping point of our planet, of our children, and our visions. So I'll end with this. Follow me, no, not go bear. Anybody? Oh, what? Yay. He's an artist and he has a, a, a song called Great Spirit. I ask all of you to look it up one day, but I'm going to challenge you today. And it says, Great Spirit, my fist is up. We'll put our fist up. A lot of us don't hear know what our can't hear our mother earth cry. Some of us can't hear her pain, but all of us in this room can hear her cry, can feel her pain. So let's be warriors now. Thank you very much.